We're talking once again with David Garrison, author of a new book that documents an unprecedented movement of Muslims to Christianity just in the last 20 years. A Wind in the House of Islam is coming out this month. David, we've been discussing this book over the course of the last six months as you've actually been writing the book. That's how fresh it is. I want to ask you now about segment three. What is the overview of that? Part three is called In the House of War. And that's a term that was actually coined by the Arab jurist Abu Hanifa uh, to describe that part of the world that's not dominated by Islam. In other words, the part of the world that most of us live in. Uh, he defined the world into two parts, the house of war, and the House of Islam. So the question in part three is how do we respond? How do we follow Christ in our relationship with Muslims here in what Muslims call the House of War? So do most Muslims know this terminology? Is there this kind of warfare type thinking in the minds of Muslims around the world in relationship to, to non-Muslims? That's a good question. Uh, certainly in the Arab world it's well known. Uh, I actually interviewed some fellows from uh, the Iranian uh, Persian world who said, you know, we don't even recognize that there is a house of Islam. For us, it's us. We Shiite Muslims in Persia and all the rest of these guys who got it wrong. <laughs> so there's a lot of division, a lot of difference of opinion. Um, the conversions that we're seeing among the Muslim world, are they real? Are they legitimate? I mean, would... Would Western Christians recognize those kinds of conversions as honest conversions to Christianity? Mm -hmm. Well, that really is the fundamental question of the book. Uh, we are seeing hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of Muslims today who are saying, Jesus is my Savior, Jesus is my Lord, Jesus is God. Now, as far as a confession of faith, that's no different than our confession of faith. As far as whether or not their lives have really been transformed, you know, we're not really in a very good position to judge every area of their life, and, and I don't think Christ ever intended for us to be in that position. But when you look at the evidence that is there, the price that they've paid, they've lost family, they've lost their property, they've been disowned, disinherited, they've been expelled from their homes. Some have been uh, beaten severely, some have been uh, shunned by their community, some have even been put to death. When I look at that degree of, um, of testing, of faith. It's hard for me to not say, you know, these are people who not only are followers of Christ, the same Christ that was revealed in Scripture, the same Christ that I gave my life to, but these are brothers and sisters who in many cases are much, much farther down the road than I am. What is it that God is using today to draw Muslims to Jesus? Well, clearly, uh, among the things that God is using, I list 10 bridges uh, in my book, and I spend a little time expounding on those. But the most important thing is that I didn't come up with these on my own. They emerge out of the interviews, out of the stories, out of the testimonies, out of the nine rooms in the House of Islam. Uh, some of the things are, are, are the sort of things we would expect, things like faith. It doesn't happen unless someone believes Muslims can respond to the gospel. And frankly, for, for many generations of Christians, that, that belief wasn't there. They said, you know, this is a group that just does not respond, so why waste our time? More and more Christians are taking the gospel of Muslims than ever before. More and more Christians are praying for Muslims than ever before. Uh, we're also seeing the Word of God translated into the heart language of Muslims like never before. Now those are the sort of things you would expect to be the sort of bridges that God would use. But there's other things that are new in our day, things like a satellite television, radio broadcast, a video, uh, people seeing the Jesus film or other gospel related videos in their own language. These have had a powerful effect. But there's also things that are counterintuitive, things that we didn't expect to find. Uh, Islam itself proved to be one of the bridges that God used to bring Muslims to faith in Christ. Now that may sound a little controversial, so let me unpack that. But within Islam, uh, violence and war, jihad, has been there from day one. And that violence, that um, propensity toward conflict and war as a solution to issues is something that's driven many, many Muslims away from Islam. So they're finding in Jesus Christ an alternative that's very different than the jihadi path to God. Also within Islam, many Muslims are for the first time reading the Quran in their own heart language. 
And it's been stunning to hear Muslims who have come to faith in Christ say the beginning point for them was when they read the Quran in Urdu, their language, or Bangla, or Bahasa Indonesia. And when they finished reading it, they closed it and said, I'm lost. There's no assurance of salvation here. There's only an insha'Allah, if God wills, maybe I'll get into heaven. And they look at their own life and they realize they have many, many sins. And so in Jesus, they find God's solution. And it's shocking and surprising and counterintuitive to see that the Quran itself proves to be one of those vehicles that God uses to bring Muslims to realize that they need a savior and they don't find that in Islam. The greatest barriers to Muslim movements to Christ, this is a quote, may be found not in the Muslim world, but within our own ranks. Strong statement. Yeah, and I think uh, we find that again and again. We've met the enemy and he is us. Uh, sometimes that means fear. When we're afraid of the Muslim world, that's not their fault, that's our fault. Fear is a choice and fear is supplanted by love and love overcomes fear. Uh, fear leads to hatred. When we have this hatred, we say that's because they're such a hateful, warlike people. Well, no, it's our responsibility not to hate back. That's the example that Jesus gave, and that's who we must be if we're going to be followers of Christ. So ultimately, the decisions are within us. Are we going to pray for Muslims? Are we going to share the gospel with Muslims? Are we going to go to Muslims? Are we going to minister to Muslims by the thousands who are coming to our community? Or are we going to retreat and remove ourselves from them? So all of those are internal issues that we must take responsibility for. So what should be the takeaway of this book, David? How do we as Western Christians need to respond to the House of Islam today? I think the great takeaway of the book is that God is doing amazing things in the Muslim world today among all kinds of Muslim people groups, men, women, young, old, educated, uneducated, urban, rural, a diaspora, uh, people who've been there for centuries, the whole gamut. And the takeaway of the book is that we have a choice. We can be a part of that and God invites us. In fact, he, he calls us to be a part of that or we can simply be an outside observer. We can even be an antagonist toward what God is doing. And my prayer and my, uh, my desire for this book is that it will encourage us at what God is doing and at what God wants us to do. Again, the book is A Wind in the House of Islam, due to be released this month. You'll find it at worldchristian.com. And you can also visit David's website at www.windinthehouse.com.